Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from John chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 7 and read through verse 29. This is what it says. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have, said, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When the one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? Pray with me. Lord, this day, may your presence be known and may our lives be changed by it. Thank you for the opportunity to come to worship you in spirit and in truth. in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A while back I was watching football on TV. My daughter came in, plopped down on the couch, 
And she said, so you're watching football, which for her to know the difference between football, baseball, and basketball, I was pretty impressed. She's not a sports fan at all. That's when she said, is this the one where Harry Potter steals the golden snitch? Well, <laughs> for Emily, that's code for, is there something else on TV? Well, I was real thankful that she chose to plop down next to me. So, I, wa <laughs> I wanted to honor her ask, even the type of ask that it was. And I said, sure. We went channel surfing. And we ended up on Undercover Boss. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched Undercover Boss. I hadn't watched it until that point. And I don't know if it's still on or not. But all the episodes are pretty much the same. It's where the CEO of a large company goes out to the most remote office in the company and in the, the, the small town of Bug Tussle, and he goes undercover. He puts on, they dress him up with a beard or a mustache and glasses or a wig and, and where no one would ever guess that the CEO has really come all the way to Bug Tussle and he applies for a job an entry-level job, and he works for a week in that job with these people who never, ever recognize that he really is the CEO of the company. And then at the end of the episode, there's the big reveal. They fly those people from, from bug tussle all the way to, to company headquarters, and they walk in to the office of the CEO and there is the reveal. The, the, the CEO pulls off his beard, his, his glasses, his wig, and, and they show that he's, he's really the boss of the company. And so those who've done good things, oh, they get things better than their wildest imagination. And those who've done the bad things, well, they're given work opportunities in another company somewhere. And it, that's pretty much the way the, the story goes. We love those kinds of stories. We tell those kinds of stories to our, to our children from the time they're little bitty. That the frog is really a prince. So be nice to frogs. Be very nice to frogs. Or the ugly duckling may be that beautiful swan. So be nice to ducks. Be nice to frogs. Be nice to ducks. Because you never know what that frog might end up being. You, you never know what that the duck. You know, you, ducks aren't always ducks, you know. We like those undercover kind of stories. Well, they're a lot older than the stories we tell to our children. They're as old as the Bible itself. You remember the story of Abraham? He was sitting out in the desert next to his tent, and three strangers come by. Well, good hospitality says that you offer them water and that you offer their camels water. But Abraham offers more than that. He offers them milk and a little bread and water for their camels. Well, it turns out that it's not three strangers, that it's two angels and God. And this is where God makes the, the big reveal that that child that Abraham's always wanted, that that child that, that he and Sarah were never able to have, they're going to have that child. And not only is that child just going to be special to them, that's the way that God's going to go undercover into the whole of the world. That's going to, the way that he's going to reveal himself into the world through this child and his children and his children's children and, and all through his family. And then that undercover story, it comes, it comes to a fine focal point right here when Jesus is born. The way that, that the Gospel of John says it is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God put on teeth and hair and eyes, went undercover. Well, that's not just a, a one-off story where there was a time 2,000 years ago where God went undercover. No, that's, that's the kingdom that Jesus talks about, this kingdom that he ushers in. That for those who have eyes to see that God's gone undercover and he shows up all around us, that he makes himself known. 
And here, here, Jesus gives the, the, the perfect, perfect illustration of that, that Jesus is in Samaria. Well, that, that may as well be bug tussle to the Jews, because there's not, I mean, the, a thought of God coming to Samaria? I mean, the Samaritans were as morally reprehensible as there possibly could be here on the face of the earth. And if there's one place God's going to stay away from, it, it's not bug tussle, it's Samaria. And, but that's where God shows up. Teeth, hair, and eyes. He, he walks into Samaria. And he does something that you just wouldn't expect God to do. That speaks to a woman at the well. Now, there's one thing men just didn't do. You didn't speak to a woman if it wasn't your mother, your daughter, or your sister. You, you just, you just didn't, didn't speak to them or your wife. You didn't speak to him. But here Jesus is. He speaks to this woman who's not his daughter, his mother, his sister, or his wife. And he asks her for a drink. And that's when this Samaritan woman, well, she starts to give Jesus some grief. And she says, how is it that you being a Jew, a Jewish rabbi on top of that, you speak to me, a Samaritan? I mean, the Jews thought they were far above the Samaritans because the Samaritans didn't take seriously God using the family of Abraham to go undercover into the world. They, I mean, they just totally disregarded that story altogether. And that's when Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, would, would you live life any different if you knew that God really was undercover? That the kingdom of God wasn't just a, an old story, but the kingdom that Jesus ushered in 2,000 years ago, and it's, and it's here today, that it's in our midst. It's not just when you die, that it's here. That God's undercover, teeth, hair, and eyes all around us, and he's making himself known for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Would, would you speak differently in the family, around the house. If it really was God who was there, would you, would you speak in a different way where you work? To your employees or your employer? Or would you speak differently at school? Would you speak differently about other people if you knew that, that God really was there undercover? What would you do? What would you do if you knew? Well, Jesus says here you'd ask. You'd ask for life. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. You'd ask for life with the, with the power of forgiveness. You'd ask for life with the power of forgiveness. Pastor Scott Hosey talks about research that was done by the Templeton Foundation. They teamed up with the University of Michigan to do a nationwide study on people's attitude toward forgiveness. And what the study discovered was that in the United States, about 75% of the people believe that, that God has forgiven them. Wipe, wipe the slate clean. Start it all over again. Whether they went to church, whether they didn't go to church, whether they're plugged into a faith group, about 75% of the people believe that, that God's forgiven them, Watch, wiped the, the slate clean. But only about half believe that they've been able to forgive others. Well, sometimes I think we tend to segment things that forgiveness is over here and love is over here and respect's over here and if we do one or the other you know two out of three is not bad but I do believe that when Jesus said love your neighbor as yourself 
this may be exactly what Jesus was talking about. That we love ourselves enough to forgive ourselves, but we aren't willing to pass that grace on to others. That to love our neighbors as ourselves is we're, we're willing to forgive them as, as well as we've forgiven ourselves. That loving your neighbor as yourself isn't just being nice to frogs or ducks. That it's a, it's a respect that's not deserved or earned. It's a grace. The same kind of grace that was given to this, this woman. In verse 21, in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming. Now that word woman right there, in Greek... It's the word guni. And guni is the same word that Jesus uses for his mother in chapter 3 at the wedding of Cana and the same word that he uses for his mother when he cries to her from the cross. That guni means special lady. It's not just a person a way to, to talk about the, this woman. And it's, a, it's, it's a way to call her a special lady. While he's known where she's done, what she's, where she's been, he speaks to her with a, with a respect that's not deserved, it's not earned. And that power to forgive, it's not something that, that we receive on our own, it's a power that Jesus gave from the cross. He took all those things that would destroy us. He nailed them to the cross to take away their power. And when he rose from the grave, he gave that power to forgive for you and for me. Even for the one that's been reprehensible toward us. Even for the one that, that treated us with contempt. That it's a a forgiveness, the power of forgiveness that's been given to us that we're able to give to others as well. And if we knew, if we knew the gift of God, we'd ask for a life that has the power to forgive. A life that has the power to forgive. But not only the power to forgive, if we knew the gift of God, if we knew that, 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 that Jesus, that God really was undercover here today, that his kingdom really was ushered in, we'd ask for life. For life with the power to change. And that's the second thing that I want to talk about this morning. Bruce Larson in his book, Ask Me to Dance, tells a story about a woman that was in his church. And um, she'd come from another country. And he describes her as a woman that her faith sparkled and the living water of the Spirit flowed out of her soul to all those around her. That a very gracious, gracious woman, that the Spirit flowed out of her soul to all those around her. Well, Bruce Larson was going to a, a, a workshop, a seminar on evangelism. He asked this woman to go with him to the to the seminar and there in the uh, they were talking about evangelism and they had on the table spread out pamphlets and strategies and demographics of the area around and and how to to share what Jesus had done the, to the to the people in that area to the unchurched people in that area and during the seminar this woman was asked by one of those people that was leading the seminar uh, if, if she would talk about the reason why the church had been so important to her in her home country. Well, she was reluctant to, to speak in front of a group, and she was a little intimidated by it. But finally, when she began to speak, she said, Well, we never gave pamphlets to people because we never had any. She said, we just showed people by our life and example what it's like to be a Christian. 
And when they can see for themselves, then they want to be a Christian too. We showed people by our life and example what it's like to be a Christian. Well, that's not just trying real hard to be nice to, to frogs and ducks. It's power. It's a power that's stronger than, than trying real hard will get us. It's a strength that comes from the, the power of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? That the chosen residence for the Spirit of God, well, it's you. It's me. And that we don't just go around trying real hard. That we allow Him to live His life through us. And that once again, God goes undercover. He wears teeth, hair, and eyes. And, and guess what? It's, it's your teeth, hair, and eyes. Into a world where His, his kingdom has already been been initiated, been established. And you're just one more evidence of it. One more evidence of it. That the power of God to change in your life is, is seen in the lives of others. It's a power we don't come by on our own. It's why Jesus rose from the dead so He could live His life through, through you and through me. It's a life with a capital L, an abundant life, an eternal life that starts in the here and now and it, it keeps on going because that, that kingdom of God, it, well, it's on earth as it is in heaven. If you knew the, if you knew the gift of God, we'd ask. We'd ask for, for life, a life that has the power of power to change. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is if we knew the gift of God, we'd ask for, for life, life that has the, the power of peace. When I was in college, I got to be good friends with a fellow named Ted. Ted was a little older than I, I was. He had already graduated, and he had started it as a teacher, high school teacher. So he had summers off. During the summers, that's when we'd go on adventures together. We started real early on. We'd backpack in the North Georgia mountains or North Carolina mountains. Sometimes we would go down to Cumberland Island, backpack and hike on, on Cumberland Island. After a while, he got a Fulbright scholarship where he spent a year in Europe, and I'd go over to visit him, and we'd take the train into the Soviet Union. We'd backpack, hike around Finland, the rest of, of Europe. We'd go on adventures, we went to Mexico, all over the United States, all through the years. Even on into my 50s, I was, Ted and I still kept up with each other. We were both married, had children, but that, that relationship was an important one. So I knew that something was wrong when I was in my 50s, and Ted gave me a call. He said, I'm sick. Well, I knew that he didn't have long to live, so every time I, I had a chance, I went up to Flat Rock, North Carolina, to, to spend time with him. And he was going through chemo, different things, over those, those years, and, and we would share with each other adventures, Tight situations we'd gotten ourselves into and tight situations we'd gotten ourselves out of. We would talk about different people we'd met. We had over 30 years worth of stories to talk about, and Ted could tell a story. We would laugh and laugh and laugh. And I remember one day, Ted told a story about a friend of his that he grew up with. And his friend's name was Danny. The two of them were about 8th or ninth grade. They were building a fort out in the middle of the woods. And he said that's when, while they were building the fort, Danny turned to him and said, Hey, Ted, have you ever asked Jesus 
to make his home in your heart? Well, Ted never went to church. And he really didn't know exactly what Danny was talking about. But he said, no, I don't believe I have. And that's when Danny told him, he said, I did that in church last Sunday. And this week, it's made all the difference. And then Danny turned to Ted and he said, you know, Ted, you can do that now if you want to. And now, in, in the last, last few days of Ted's life, Ted's telling me this story. He's telling me this story that they're in the eighth grade in the middle of the woods with just he and his friend Danny while they're building a, a fort that he invited Jesus to make his home in his heart. There weren't any long aisles. <laughs> there, were, there wasn't a choir singing in the background. No tears, no sorrow. He just asked. He asked. And that, that started Ted in a relationship with the risen Christ. Jesus, undercover, made alive in, in Ted's heart. And now in the last few days of Ted's life, this is what Ted said. It made all the difference that it had given him peace. It had given him the power of forgiveness. I saw that in Ted's life over 30 years. It had, it had made a huge difference. I had seen change, continued change in Ted's life over 30 years. And I'd seen that difference in, in a peace. The way the Bible talks about it in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests, there's the ask, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That there's some things we just don't receive until we ask. It's not that God's reluctant to give us. As a matter of fact, He died on the cross to give us forgiveness, but folks don't receive it until they ask. A power, a power to change. He rose from the grave in order to give us that power, that power to change. But you know, most often we don't receive that power until we ask. The power, the power of peace that surpasses all that we comprehend, all that we understand, where, where Jesus is the one that stands as the sentinel, as the guard of our, of, of our heart and our mind. Where Jesus goes undercover. He puts on, well, teeth, hair, and eyes. Your teeth, hair, and eyes. And he goes out into a world where his kingdom, his kingdom is already established where we have eyes and ears to see and to hear it. Well, that's a peace. That's a peace that we have to ask for. This morning it may be that you've never asked. So I want to pray with you. Pray with you now. Let's pray. Jesus, this day, this day, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. As you live undercover here in this world, that we might give thanks and praise, but that we might also ask. There may be somebody here right now today that is never asked for the power of forgiveness in their life. Your power to, to wipe away, to cleanse, to make whole. And your power to help forgive others. That's a power we don't have. From the cross, you gave just that kind of power. It may be that this morning, there's some that 
that want to change, but know they don't have the power to change. That the thought of you living your life through us, that, that we are your temple, well, it, that's a power too great to imagine. Well, we can imagine being nice to, to other people, to being nice to frogs and, and the, the ducks, but power to change, it's not in us. It's the reason you rose from the grave. Lord, grant that power. Breathe on us that power. And it may be that you're bringing to mind those, those areas that we need to change. May it not just come to mind, but may it come to fruition. Produce fruit in our lives. Lord, it may be that folks listening this morning that have not known peace, not now, not ever, it's your spirit that gives peace. Lord, may you be undercover, undercover, teeth, hair, and eyes in our lives. Not one day, but this day. And may we know that peace that surpasses all understanding. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.